Today on The State of Us, holiday traditions and food, as well as the astonishing benefits of retelling family stories. Welcome to the State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller, joined, of course, today by our friendly redneck liberal, Mr. Lance L. Jackson and senior historian here at True Chat. We'll get the full title in there today because we are talking about holiday food and traditions. And in the back half of the show, we're going to spend two segments on the benefits of telling family stories. And you might be like, what? And 90 percent, get this, 90 percent of young adults, when asked, can successfully retell family stories, even if at the time they seemed disinterested. And we're going to discuss the social benefits of that, the mental health benefits of that, and more. But before we get to that, we're going to dive in and talk a little bit about how Lance and I will be spending Thanksgiving and what it looks like with us. We'd like to hear what it looks like for you. You can send us an email, podcast at thestateofus.org. So without further ado friendly redneck liberal, what does Thanksgiving look like at the Jackson household? Does it, does it take place on Thanksgiving? Let's start with that. Cause not everybody, right? Not everybody does it on Thanksgiving. It does this year. It has in the past. Um, we are now getting older children who now have other family commitments and I'm taking a page from my mother's book. And that is when we got older and had children, and I being the oldest, she said, it's important for you guys to establish your own routines on Christmas morning and Christmas Eve. So my mother graciously began to hold Christmas, the family Christmas for her at different times. And myself and my three siblings and their families, mom would pick a day, the 20th of December or whatever. And we would have Christmas on that day with my mom. And I asked her one time, I said, well, mom, then what do you do on Christmas day? She goes, well, it's just another day. I've already had my Christmas. And so I just told my brother this last weekend, you know, his oldest daughter is having to go with her fiance down to his family for Thanksgiving because they're going to trade Christmas and Thanksgiving. And I said, you know, I always thought that was cool that mom did that. And I said, so I'm willing to do that next year. I I think in the future, we may change that a little bit because Uh, And again, that's based off of stories, you know, and based off of family tradition. For our family, it's usually held on Thanksgiving. Um, Very typical. The only thing that's been a little interesting in, you know, the last five or six years since Brett and I have been together is just where we do Thanksgiving. Frequently, it's here uh, in Ohio rather than going to where his family is in Chicago. And that's mainly because usually his work schedule is such that you're talking about the only way you know, to do it is to to get in and out in one or two days, and that's uh, tenuous. And Brett and I both value, I think, the holiday time, and it's hard if you're spending that strictly on traveling. Um, but on Christmas, we, we usually make an effort two years ago. Last year was different because of the pandemic, obviously, but two years ago, we actually flew in early Christmas morning to Chicago and then flew back late that night. But typically, Thanksgiving is here. And I am typically um, a big part of preparing the meal. So I don't do everything because there are a couple things that um, I will profess to not be (coughs) the most skilled at. And one of those things is the gravy. It may be surprising to our listeners. I am not a big gravy person. Um, I don't mind certain gravies, but it's just not something, I don't know why, it's just not something that's ever really been a big deal to me. But it is a big deal to... um, my father and my brother um, and Brett, they all very much uh, like gravy. Um, pr- I'm pretty much the only one that's not, you know, huge on it. And my grandmother made gravy from the broth, you know, of the turkey for forever. And so that is a, there is a way to make it, you know, and um, it's a fine tuning process. And my mother, makes that because she stood next to my grandmother for years and learned approximately how to get it right. So I usually make uh, the turkey. Well, no, but I mean, the second important question is when do you eat? Ah, is it lunch or dinner? Right. Mm. Um, Typically, it is a late 
lunch. Or you could, I suppose, contend that it's a very early dinner. But usually it's around one or two. Um, so in the past five or six years, it's been about 12.30 or one. So yeah, I was it's definitely say, lunch. I always like to, I've always planned it for about one. But I'm usually starting to put it on the table about 11.30 or 12 because everybody's coming in. And they're eating all the munchies, and I'm like, "Well, oh, you guys, you're gonna get filled up." On yeah, you know, because they're, they're eating off of. Because I usually have a cheese ball, and I have a veggie tray and a vegetable tray. Because I have all these young millennials now who eat healthy, and you know, they want all this trendy. Yeah, they don't want cookies and chips and all the things that I, you know my mom used to put out. So I try to put out all the, the healthy stuff. Plus, um, you know, I, I'm really grateful to say since you mentioned. Stuffing. Um, I, I've got these gluten free people that have been coming oh. to my house for the last couple of years, and I've just not been a very good host. My mother would be, you know, very upset with me. I guess I was a good host. I let them use my pans, you know, so they could cook the food that they wanted to eat. Um, I didn't make anything for you, <laughs> still, but here's yeah. a pan. You can make it yourself. But I found out an interesting <laughs> thing, and this may light up the phone lines, but my stuffing is gluten free because wow. I just use cornmeal. Uh huh. And that's right. My you don't, yeah, you don't put any flour. I don't put any bread or anything, yeah. any floured stuff in there. And my sister in law just sent me like five smiling emojis the other day because she she was telling um, my brother all she wants is stuffing, and it's just she's been gluten free hard for like the last six months and has never felt better. And she's like, I'm gonna blow it because I'm gonna have to eat stuffing. And I said, I texted her and I said, Hey. Good news. Good news. You can have all the stuffing you want. I use no bread. <laughs> I yep. am gluten free on my That's stuffing. Right, baby. So lots healthy. of lots of grease yep. and butter <laughs> and everything else, but we got no wheat flour in, in the stuffing. Uh, sounds like some moral licensing will yeah. be occurring there on right. the uh, the cheating. But yeah, I usually make the the uh, stuffing. Or I, I learned because I, I I was wondering about you know this whole thing of if you don't make it inside the bird. Is it really stuffing? You know, this is one that, of those char- ch- charts and graphs thing. Does that right? make it dressing if it's outside? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, it's dressing technically, right? Because it's never, it's not, you're not stuffing the bird with it. They are the same thing. It really, the only difference is the preparation method. And for those, I know there are people that profess you got to cook it in the bird. Um, but I, I have always had better luck with the consistency and... Uh, enjoyment of it outside of the bird. It's the number one thing for the people who the, attend our dinner is the stuffing, mm-hmm. and it's always made outside. And again, it's family tradition. That's the way grandma made it, and that's the way mom made it, so that's the way I make it. Because it's kind of come down. I am, you know, yeah. they, I mean, they, they tell me, you are the Thanksgiving, you know, maker. And, and so it's like, oh, I, I'm, and I, I'm, now later years, I'm open. I'm like, you know, since mom passed away, I've been the one who's doing it. But I always tell them, hey, anybody else want to take this over? You go for it. And like, oh, no, no, it's yours. We're we're all, our mouth's been salivating since Halloween, you know, so it's all it's all on you. And I'm like, great, you know, the pressure. But I remember when mom was in charge and I'd kind of just mess around in the kitchen, you know, with her. That was much more enjoyable than the sweat coming off my brows. I'm running around trying to leave the burns on my hand at a minimum of uh, of less than 5. <laughs> right. You know. Yeah, well the and that's interesting because in my family it focuses more on the gravy and mashed potatoes or the family sort of long tradition being handed down. The bird is cooked has been cooked differently based on who's doing it. Um I was the one that started the, you know, slow roasting it overnight. Um which has worked out I think tremendously well. smoking them now. Have you ever... I've heard of that. Yeah. I I mean, I have never personally smoked a turkey. And, you know, I know a lot of people deep fry the turkey. But I I feel like those are both big commitments. Like, you know what I mean? You can't just smoke a turkey or deep fry it. Like, you got to buy the right equipment for that. So it would make a lot of sense to go to somebody else's or have somebody else let you try smoked or, (laughs) you know, deep fried turkey and make sure that you want it. Because otherwise, you got this, you know... I mean, it is one of those things, like I look at the roasting pan that I use for the turkey, you know, and it's like, I use this twice a year, you know, and sometimes, you know, we do ham or whatever for Christmas, but the... the Christmas is ham. I am big on dressing, um, and that, the recipe I use is inspired by my aunt, actually, so um, it, she used to make it for years, and when I sort of took over um, Thanksgiving, and they don't always come over for Thanksgiving anymore, because they have, you know their children 
have their families. And so sometimes we see them, sometimes we don't, but she would usually make it. And I based it off of hers. The only thing is hers had celery in it, um, which is very standard. Celery is very common. I am not a big celery person. I'm okay with it in the stuffing, um, but I swapped it out for zucchini squash um, because I like zucchini and um, it's not exactly the same, uh, but I prefer the zucchini bits over the celery bits. Well, I just got, I have to get in. The second thing is because it's a kind of a different family recipe. I know everybody has sweet potatoes, oh. but, but we slice, after I boil the sweet potatoes, we slice them. After and, boiling. And after boiling them, then we douse them in butter mm. and brown sugar and then caramelize them in the oven. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so we took all the nutritional value of the sweet yep. potato and just totally and it wiped becomes, it out. It becomes a, the sweet potato becomes a holder of butter and brown sugar. Uh, right. And lib- it is a vessel. Liberal. <laughs> I mean, there is butter swimming in the tray oh. as it's caramelizing. and. <laughs> Okay. Um, it's it's floating or swimming. Yes, and my my sister in law and my wife are in charge of sprinkling the brown sugar because you know that's the key ingredient. Yes, to it. So okay, that that that, that <laughs> follows the stuffing at the top. Gotcha. You know, the bird takes the center, giving piece, a good you know, brine. We to talk the, about to turkey, the sweet potatoes, <laughs> but it's it's stuffing and sweet potatoes. If we had that, I don't think anybody would miss turkey at all. The turkey, the turkey is, I think, where I excel, but it's also the thing that I practice the most. So that would make sense, right? Based on state of us history, the things we practice the most are tend to be the ones that, that we do the best. That we do the best. So, but we've got to talk about family stories because as much as the food is fun and it's what Lance and I enjoy, as he kind of highlighted at the beginning of the show, I think the the biggest benefit, and we know scientifically, is the opportunity to get together and to be with people that we care about. So what are the benefits of family stories and how significant are they? The answers might surprise you. To find out, keep it here on The State of Us and we'll be right back. Stories during the holidays certainly are not a new concept But in the age of social media, do kids, or adults for that matter, actually pay attention to these stories? Well, according to an article in the Wall Street Journal, more than 90%, yes, 90%, 9 out of 10 teenagers and young adults can retell family stories when asked, even if they seem uninterested when the stories were told, according to a 2018 study. Why you care? Well, there's such a high percentage of people that have the ability to retell these stories when they're told. You're going to learn that throughout this episode that these stories not only help instill a sense of identity, but actually are proven to uh, provide better coping skills for young adults uh, through college uh, and as they go into their first jobs. Numerous studies uh, indicate just that. I just find it amazing that people don't do this because in the article they give you hints on how to start doing this. I guess being raised in a Southern home, telling stories was just part of the daily daily life, but um, totally uh, enamored with, with the article because it finally proves what I've been <laughs> saying all along, you know, that yeah. we there are ways to give kids tools to deal with some of these emotions besides pills. And it's actually give them some connections with their family. This applies all the time. Sure. Uh, It just so happens that typically when most people tell more stories and when more people are willing to listen to said stories are around the holidays. Right. People aren't in quite quite as much a hurry on that on that particular day. Um, But the point, all of this data isn't specific to you have to wait Right. Until the holidays to do it, right? So the best holiday stories, according to the article, are funny or entertaining and often convey life lessons. According to a psychology professor and director of Emory University's Institute for the Liberal Arts, quote, they have a very important function in teaching children that I belong here. I'm part of these stories. They provide not just a script for life, but a set of values and guideposts. And I think it, what's important is many times we need to talk about the older generation to the younger generation, even if the older generation isn't there. And as I'm getting older, I realize the importance of that because now uh, at many family gatherings with my mom and dad both uh, deceased, 
I'm the one who's the oldest one there and telling stories, not just about them, but then also about grandparents or great grandparents that nobody's ever met. And then I've got connections to what would be the youngest generation to their great, great grandparents who were my great grandparents. And those stories were told to me. And now I'm that person that's responsible to tell those stories. So it was really important that they were told when I was, you know, six, seven, eight years old about those people, because now I can continue to share them. And it's part of too, when you talk about that history perspective, oral tradition Mm -hmm. that, that so many, you know, um, societies have, you know, if they don't have a written history, they have an oral history. And it's, this is an important part of creating a family unit, right? Of, of, right. And, and not just mom and dad, but the family, you know, that there are people that you can turn to when you're in need. Yeah. And that, that's, uh, and I think part of what this points out is it's biological or otherwise, right? Exactly. I mean, it doesn't, they don't have to necessarily be quote unquote flesh and blood family. It has more to do with the group of people you're close to, uh, sharing things and the meaning they have. And that's part of what you get that is an underlying theme, I think, from this. Tell me if you disagree, Lance, is that it's not so much the particulars of the story that are important. It's the meaning of the story exactly. that's important. Right. So whether or not Lance perfectly recounts every detail exactly the way it happened or not, that's not important. And not nearly as important as what it means to Lance, right. what he took away from it, what others take away from it. Exactly. Right? And in fact, uh, it's not just about building identity, but there's a real evidence to suggest uh, researchers in another study asked families with 10 to 12 year old children to reminisce about happy and negative experiences, then followed up two years later. Children whose parents explained negative emotions and how they resolved them had better social skills and academic skills. So not only did they perform better in social situations, could interact with other people better, but they actually got better grades. Well, and that, why would that be? Well, because they've learned that having these feelings and these emotions are okay, number one, that I'm not weird or different because I have these feelings, but that I've also now been given ways to solve said feelings and emotions correctly and incorrectly by, because, you know, it's, you you tell a story and you tell a story on yourself. It's like, yeah, I did this and I got in trouble. And then ding, 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 the bell goes off. Huh. Maybe I better not react the same way that, you know, uncle Lance did, or, you know, the same way that my dad did, or the same way my grandfather did. But then at the same, by the same token, you tell a story where it worked out. Then when they get in that situation, A, they don't feel uncomfortable, and B, they're like, hey, wait a minute, this is what happened to Aunt Susie, and when she got in this situation, she did this, and it worked out, and they have something to draw from in their toolbox of emotions, and it works out for them, you know, and it's like, wow, it did work, you know, and those those are the important things that people, because so many times they're, they're running around, and I don't know what to do, I've never, nobody's ever talked about this before, I don't know, I've never felt this emotion before. And when you find out that other people have it, it's like, oh, okay. Yep. You know, and then it's okay. And then it validates everything. And how people dealt with it. Right. And then you feel feel better. Yeah. I mean, I'm not the only one that's ever felt this way. Well, and the author of the article points out too, goes on to explain from that study that family stories also can serve as antidotes for the pressures that many teens feel to get good grades, get into elite colleges, and land immediately on the established career path. And the point here is that If you ask your family around the table, it's probably pretty likely that you'll hear several stories of it didn't go quite that way for them. Exactly. Um, Or at least the road bumps along the way. And just as we're pointing out with the emotions and stuff, the same thing applies here. This conveys that just because things don't go exactly the way you envision them going doesn't mean that all is lost and the world has fallen apart. Um, And you might even pick up ways of you know, well, so-and-so did this, so I'm going to try to do that now. Now I have an idea about, well, that sounds interesting. Maybe I'll give that a try. And even not only with family, but then as in the classroom as a teacher, I would tell kids all the time, uh, you know, I wasn't the perfect student and, and never claimed to be. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we were talking in here pre-show production and, you know, National Honor Society and all this kind of stuff. And I just kind of kept quiet, but I wasn't even close. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't meet the requirements or the demands or, or whatever, but yet I've been successful. You know, and so I think kids need to hear that there, that there is more than one path. Right. You know, because my, my daughters would both tell you, 
it's like, I look at them and I go, well, why are you still in school? Why are you so worried about education? And it's like, then, you know, they kind of just look at me like, well, that's all you and mom did while we were growing up. And they've both said, we never discussed about going to college. We just figured it was an expectation because in the talking of the family, well, grand, granddad got, went to college, you know, grandma went to college, you and mom went to college. So it was just like, it was going to happen. It, to them, it wasn't a discussion as if. It was just where and what was I going to study, which we never had that discussion. We never forced them. I mean, because I'm a big believer, as people, you know, listeners on the show know, there's a lot of different ways to get to where you want to get, you know, yep. w- w- where you want to go. But um, through stories, my children just figured they were going to college. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, when you, when I look at school, it's like, well, I, again, I wasn't a bad student, you know, I don't think. I mean, I didn't cause problems for I teachers. I was. I did. But- but I always looked at, because it's just how, I mean, it's just how I approach life. I learned the rules of the system and I did everything I could to meet the rules the easiest way possible, uh, you know, which actually took a good bit of work to figure out, you know, so there's the irony of figuring out how to game the system actually requires I know, l- I learned effort. the rules and figured out how to break them without trying to get caught. Oh, okay. <laughs> but like I... You know, most, I think probably 90%, if not higher, of my classmates all took chemistry. Right. You know, I did not. Right. You know, still graduated. Um, and I spent two years in psychology classes that didn't exist at our school. Right. Um, until I found a way to create them. And right. I was the only student in those classes, you right. know, because I would have rather done those things and I didn't want to do chemistry. Yep. And there were rules in place that allowed, you know, the avoidance of that stuff. Um, so I guess the point is that, you know, it, it is to say there's more than one path, but that's part of the benefit of, but it's good to hear. of these type of stories. Right? right. And in a 2008 study, researchers at Emory quizzed 40 children ages 10 to 14 on 20 family history questions, such as how did their parents meet or where their grandparents grew up. Those, those who answered more questions correctly showed on separate assessments less anxiety and fewer behavioral problems. So keep, I mean, think about this. Right. Just, right. So you asked them 20 questions about their family's history. Yep. The ones that answered more of family history questions correctly, less anxiety, less behavioral problems. Because they feel connected to that group or, you know, to use the word and I'll spell it, you know, clan with a C, okay, Mm -hmm. that they feel connected to a larger group of people to a larger community and therefore that gives you comfort. It's like I know that if I know that if things fall apart, like if I'm I'm not feeling well today and I've got a lot of cooking to do, if things fall apart on me, I know that my daughters and my wife and my brother and sister-in-law and my nieces will all come in and they'll get dinner on the table. Right. You know, I mean it's just they'll everybody will still eat. We'll, they'll still have a good it's time. It's going to happen. Yeah. You know, we're we're all there for each other and we we while we enjoy the food at Thanksgiving, we enjoy the togetherness because it's a very busy time of the year for them and for for both of our families. And to get together and spend time talking <laughs> is just what we look forward to. The food is is delicious, but it's secondary. It'll just be the the camaraderie right. of getting it all together that would that makes is the fun. So there's plenty more to share uh, on this. I think very fascinating topic. It is one our. Our uh, interns in the booth today gave us kind of a look at, about doing this particular episode. Like, what? What are we talking about retelling family? But, but we'll, we'll talk about it in the second <laughs> segment of a young man their age now. Yes. Who leaned on these stories and now has become successful in his career choice. Exactly. And we're going to be talking about more of those types of stories and also tips and tricks on how to do your own stories uh, in the upcoming segment. So... If you want to learn more about the benefits of stories and what type of stories you should be telling, keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. In a 2018 study, researchers quizzed 40 children ages 10 to 14 on 20 family history questions. Those that answered more questions correctly showed less anxiety and fewer behavioral problems. The benefits of retelling family stories 
Uh, they're not just sentimental, they're absolutely real. And that's why we're talking about it today. I think a nice message for the holidays, but also uh, very important and backed up by uh, evidence and research. Yes, Lance? Yes, it is. It's nice to know that the thoughts and feelings I've had for years now, um, the professionals say well, that's that kinda, it is good. That's kind of what the, that's the, like the theme of the state of us, right? Isn't you it? just go yeah. along every few episodes, we find something and it's like, man, I'm so glad we found this data that says exactly what I've thought yeah. for. <laughs> I knew I was right. Now I've got proof to back it up. <laughs> now I've got proof. So you can just point to when people say, how do you know you're right? Well, go listen to the state of us. Right. Right. So, uh, so let's talk some about family stories, shall we? Well, we kind of teased it, but this young man was 19 and he was offered a chance to go to Los Angeles and work in the film industry as an intern one summer. And he was like, yeah, that's really crazy. I hear I am 19. I don't have a job. I'm just going to go to LA and just hang out. I mean, I don't know what to do. And he remembered as a young boy listening at the, at the table to talks of his grandparents and things that they had done and career choices they had made and chances that they had taken. And he's a, even though while I did, I tried to get out of these stories, I didn't like to listen to them. I'm like, oh, really? I got to sit here. I just want to go play, you know, play with my cousins or whatever. But he, then he drew on those stories 10 years later and he said, well, my grandfather took a chance and he was successful. So why not? I mean, it's in my family's past, you know, that we take chances every once in a while. And he took a chance and now he's in New York and in cinematography and doing exactly what he wanted because he took a chance when he was 19. And one of the main reasons he took that chance was because he had heard stories about his grandparents who during the depression or I forget exactly what the, the situation was, but well, they had taken chances and it had turned out okay for them. So they gave him the confidence to try something out of the norm, which is, which is huge, which is exactly what we're talking about is when, when you hear that <sighs> other people have tried something that you're thinking of doing and they survived it either in a funny way, a sad way, a good way, whatever. Wow. They made it through. They tried it and they came out okay on the other end. That that's important. And especially when it comes from, you know, it's not somebody you read in a book, but it's somebody that you can relate to or who came from your your bloodline or your family line. So uh let's let's move into uh some personal stories, Lance, shall we? I don't know where to go. I mean, because my kids know all my stories, you know. I well, mean, yeah, but our and, listeners and, don't and grandpa stories. Well, I told you one earlier, right off air, that you know, we were talking about jingles and change and things like that. And I remember when I was three and four years old, my grandfather who worked for the forest department, a, a CCC job during the great depression, he was big on men carrying change in their pocket. He said, because that way you're not a vagrant, you're not going to be a bum. And so when I was three and four years old, he would always hand me a couple pennies or a couple coins and have me put them in my pocket. And I remember putting them in my pocket and, you know, playing around with those coins in my fingers and taking them home and always having. And so, and he said, you need that because other, because people need to know that you're a man of stature, that you're not a bum, that you're not walking the streets with no money, which for him was a big deal during the depression. There were you right. know, soup lines and bread lines and things like that. And, and he didn't, he never was, was lucky enough that he didn't have to do that. He didn't have a lot because he was working in one of, you know, FDR's uh, alphabet soup government jobs. But, he was able to take care of things and he always had money in his pocket. And I think about that now because that's what I'm known for around, you know, the school and everything else. I've always carrying cash and I've always got change and I save all my change now and I roll it and I take it in for money, you know, and my kids laugh. They go, dad, our inheritance is, is wrapped up in your dresser. And I'm like, uh -huh. yeah, there's, there's some truth to that. But I think it all stems from, my grandfather looking at me as a little boy and saying, here, you need to always have money in your pocket. Don't because, ever be broke. <laughs> because that means because that means you can walk around with your head held high yep. and you can take part in society. And it's just and I and I still I just it's just part of my core being. And it happened when I was, you know, three and four or five years old before it was preschool. Yeah. In the in the uh, vein of in in the name of grandpa's, I guess, mine actually was uh he enlisted in the uh, Army Air Corps back before there was a United States Air Force uh, when World War II started. Right. And he wanted to go be a fighter pilot, you know, and do his part. And when he got uh, to his assignment, they said, 
well, we don't need more pilots. We got plenty of them. Uh, we need more mechanics because the planes are being shot down so right. fast and damaged so fast that we're not keeping up. You know, we got plenty of people to fly and we don't have nearly enough people to fix them. So he was, he became a mechanic. Um, and not too long after he had started, you know, working as a mechanic, he was on an airplane wing working on it. A pilot didn't know he was there and started taxiing and he fell off and injured his back. Mm. Um, and he spent months in an army hospital and then was honorably discharged. And, but for him, that was devastating. You know what I mean? Cause he wanted, he wanted to be out there contributing to the war effort. And here he was laying in a hospital, you know, for months, uh, and then basically, you know, discharged, but kicked out because they're right. like, well, we can't, you know, you got an injury. We can't do yeah. anything with you. So go home, get out of here. And then he spent some time farming, but that desire to help didn't go away. And the interesting thing is for a man who graduated with a class of 12 from Urbana Local, which okay. doesn't mean anything to our listeners, but was a one, you know, basically a one building K through 12 tiny classroom. He never went to college and he kept pushing as a farmer for the Farm Bureau Right. to become better at communicating all of this information that they kept finding out. You know, all these studies that were being done, uh -huh. um, and you're talking, you know, 60s and 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s, all this stuff happening. Um, and he's like, man, we got to, people need to know this stuff. You know, they got to, nobody knows he's, he's with all these farmers in the county and it's like, they don't know this stuff and they'd be so much better at farming if we shared this information. So right. he, through the Farm Bureau, got hooked up with Nationwide uh, and convinced them to start a communications company. And so they owned around 20 to 30 radio stations. Right. And they broadcasted all over the state of Ohio and the region. And that's how they started getting all this information out to- To the farmers. Right, about to the farmers. What they needed to mm -hmm. do to be a, have a better, run a better business. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and then, you know, basically not out of his own doing, but- the the nationwide board was so impressed with him they asked him to be the chairman there you go. of a fortune 100 company with no college degree right <laughs> who was a farmer yeah you know well, i mean basically but he had a good idea right you know so i think that's the and then of course you look at what i do today and it's you know yeah, there's so that there's, connection there's that connection to communications for sure it goes back away well this one always gets me in trouble just but it has to do with sitting down at the table before and you know most people want to say some kind of words over the food before uh -huh. they they partake, and my my grandpa because that the first story I told was about my granddad, uh, but my grandpa this was the first time I think that my wife um, ever went back home with me. When I say back home, I mean going to Missouri, and my grandpa and they're they're from you know really from the the hills, and uh, but <laughs> never a truer soul was born, and his wife was just my grandma was just a. She was something else. She was always griping at him and, and on him and just never cut him any slack. And she's scurrying around the kitchen if she finally gets all the food on the table because she's trying to impress, you know, because the oldest grandson has brought his future bride to the family, you know, mm -hmm. and so they're getting, <laughs> she's getting the royal treatment, oh, yeah. you know. And we sit down and and uh, she looks at him and she goes, Fred, you need to, you need to say Grace. And, you know, he's like, what? He, he was so laid back. He just went with the flow. He looked around. He goes, well, Grace and Roland, you didn't see the prospects. Dig in. And Grace <laughs> and Roland were two cousins from the family, you know. Uh -huh. But he was like, it was like she was trying to make it all formal. And, everything, uh -huh. and that wasn't that side of my family. They were very down to earth, would do anything for you kind of people. But they were just very down to earth. They, they weren't big on social to-dos, you know. And yeah. here she was trying to make it a big social to-do. And, and Grandpa just sits down and he, he, looks at, he looks at my future wife and he goes, well, Grace and Roland, you didn't see the prospects, dig in. <laughs> and that was it. And I mean, Grandma was fit to be tied. She was throwing her dish towel and she was so mad at him. And my wife just started, she kind of grinned under her, you know, covered her face because she didn't want to get in trouble. She goes, that was really cool. He just diffused the whole situation. I said, that's him. That's what he does, you know. And that what is, brings us the friendly redneck liberal. That's it, right. <laughs> that's where that comes from, you know. Just, yeah. just down home, down to earth, good people, just wanting to get along with folks and, and help out, you know. would Didn't have anything, but would give you the shirt off his back if you needed one. You know, that, you know just, and again, that's a phrase maybe that our, our young folks there in the booth have never heard of, you know, giving you, you know, giving somebody the shirt off your back. Yeah. But that was just 
the way it was. You know, that's just what happened. You know, and I remember you talk about being here on and doing things. My other grandfather, my, my granddad, he would go down and he was a deacon in the church. And there would be a snowstorm where today we cancel church, right? We can't, yeah. we do all this. And he would go down and open the church for the hour that it was supposed to be open. And my grandma would say, you're going to break your neck to get there. And he goes, if somebody needs help in a storm like this, where are they going to go? They're going to go to the church. Right. Somebody needs to be there because they know the church is open. You know, and I think about that all the time when we see now, oh, we have to close this and we have to close that. And we have, and he, if the church was supposed to be open and he didn't think anybody else would get there, he would make it his business to be there and open the doors and sit there. And as far as I know, nobody ever came and the phone never rang, you know, for anybody looking for help, yep. but it was like somebody might need help. So I'm going to be there in case it's, it's necessary. Well, Lance, we've had a great conversation today about the benefits of family stories and, of course, the thing that's near and dear to us, the food related to Thanksgiving. Um, We're hopeful that this episode today um, was kind of a lighthearted thing one week before Thanksgiving for all of our listeners. Um, For you longtime listeners, you know that around this time of year, we try to do one or two of these kind of episodes where uh, we stop the hustle and bustle of the busy agenda of the state of us and take some time to talk about Um, the things that should matter, hopefully, to all of us just as much. And I think that's part of why we had this conversation today, right, Lance? That is it. You know, our mission here at True Chat is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And we've done that today and told you that, you know, listening to those stories and taking them in and telling them or retelling them are important for everybody, as well as the breaking of bread and and gathering with our loved ones. Um, And, you know, Share it with folks, you know, tell them this is important. And if they don't have anybody, then bring them in, you know, and bring them into your home because we've we've both done that on the past too. opened our doors to whomever needs it if they are lonely on this day. So if you know someone, bring them in and and let them participate. It's good for the soul for for all uh, included. And tell people if they want to start listening to the show on on their own that they can find us on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere podcasts are found. And the other thing that I want to mention, Lance, is on Thanksgiving, there will be an episode from the state of us. And I can tell you what it is because it's it's being done ahead of time because Lance and I will be busy. Um, but I think it's going to be super critical. It'd be great for people to listen to together. It's called Ghosting, Why We Ignore Friends for Phones. Um, and I think that it, it's like, what better day? than to have this discussion and maybe you can listen to it and then talk to your family about it. I think that would be great because um, again, it's one of those things we do it and we don't always realize the different reasons that we do it. And that's what that episode is going to be about. So you can hear new episodes of the state of us Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, First thing in the morning as a podcast. And then again on the weekends in select talk radio, AM and FM radio stations across the country. For the state of us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to our producer, Bradley Butch, and thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We hope you have a wonderful holiday. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.